Good morning everybody. Normally there should be no further reference to the title of the talk, but I find a bit of mismatch between the title on the screen and the title printed in the abstract book, where the, uh, there's a bit of juxtaposition and it reads in the abstract book as spiritual, cognitive, neuro-environmental phenomenology. So that's to point out a bit of lapse in not correcting it on the title of the talk displayed here. The reference at the top represents the first public discourse where the emphasis was laid on integrating inner experience with the epistemology of natural sciences. That is scientific methodology. Over the years, it has developed into an omni quantum theory for spiritual consciousness system modeling in cosmology. The important point that I would like to make here is that. The inner experience provides an alternative way to study the macrocosmic phenomena. Rather than soaring into space in search of macrocosmic secrets, one turns inward and discovers some of the secrets otherwise not revealed in the world outside. However, it is necessary to bring to bear upon such first person experiences the testing methodology of third person natural sciences particularly neuroscience in the last 20 years or so. Earlier this month, I had an opportunity to read the book by Price and Barrel titled Inner Experience and Neuroscience. The reason I'm quoting from that book is that unexpectedly our approach to integrating inner experience with scientific methodology has been similar to what Price and Barrel have mentioned. They use fourfold paradigms for this purpose where the first one is noticing the content of specific experiences that is first person inner experiences and second is describing these experiences from a first person perspective so the report is also as a sort of co-investigator rather than being presented as a third person report from somebody else. Understanding these experiences through discovering common factors and their interrelationships. These factors would include even 
such mundane aspects as anxiety, pain, etc. And lastly, applying quantitative methods to test generally the functional relationships between these common factors. That is, propose certain hypotheses and subject them to the test of scientific methodology. We fully subscribe to this fourfold methodology and finding it very similar to our approach, I thought it best to accept it from this remarkable book. The first three are unique in that the investigators are often included as participants of their own research study, that is co-investigation. Questions, not hypotheses, guide the first three stages. So it is not necessary to frame the hypotheses in advance, but it's through first-person account of phenomenology that these hypotheses are later formulated and tested. And the last stage is where the scientific methodology comes in, using psychometric methods and for quantitative purposes, psychophysics. Since the model that we have in mind is also a quantum theoretic model, I might briefly allude to two leading approaches to quantum theory as far as consciousness is concerned. One is due to von Neumann step formulation and consists of three processes of choice, causation, and chance. While the other is the celebrated Penrose Hamroff, objective, orchestrated objective reduction theory, which has three parts, the Gordian part, the gravity part, and the microtubule part. Chris Fields, in his paper on a model theoretic interpretation of environmentally induced super selection of ion selection, published in November 2012 in International Journal of General Systems, explains the resulting classicality on making observation in any quantum system, he shows logically that observer independent environmentally induced super selection is a myth and does not produce classicality. So there is no observer independence which is possible in quantum theoretic system. Rocco Gennaro, in his book on the consciousness paradox, also published recently by the MIT Press in 2012, defends the so-called hot brain thesis. Hot is standing for higher order thoughts. He maintains that what makes a mental state conscious is that a suitable higher order thought is directed at that mental state. In the Eastern philosophy of saints, particularly of Radha Swami faith, higher order consciousness of a spirit force acts at the lower order consciousness of a spirit forces as well as further lower order consciousness of mind or mental states and is still lower order consciousness of material or physical states to make them conscious. So that's the philosophy which we hold and which we want to subject to scientific inquiry. In fact, inspired from these recent developments, I would like to propose hot consciousness can correlate where hot stands not for higher order thought, 
but hierarchical order theory of consciousness hot consciousness is then hierarchical order theory of consciousness and scan stands for spiritual cognitive and neural and environmental correlates i want to emphasize that we use a one to one correspondence in proposing this spiritual system theory framework as in the physical system theory physical system theory has its fundamental axiom so the spiritual system theory also starts with a fundamental action in the physical system theory referred to by kenik tokar and keshwan and published in the book dated 1966 makes use of certain comp- component postulate and system interconnection postulates to formulate the system model equations here also in the spiritual system theory modeling we have used comparable postulates regarding the various parts of the system that is its subsystems and components and then their interconnection with each other so there are postulates comparable to those in the physical system theory and then we come up with a system graph model deduced from either analytical hierarchy process proposed by sati or warfield's interpretive structural model and then we have certain qualitative analysis possible at this stage of the resulting system representation all theories have certain fundamental axiom and postulates system model predictions and its verification of these model predictions which would decide whether the theory holds or not so that is what i suppose is the scientific framework in which we are carrying out our integrated epistemology of combining first person experiences with third person scientific methodology and so long as the predictions are not shown to be inconsistent the theory holds so that's how we are proceeding now that's about the kind of model that we have come up with based on the first person phenomenology broadly speaking it has three major subsystems apart from the physical universe in the macrocosm it envisages the region of universal mind and the region of universal spirit so these are the three main subsystems each subsystem is further divided into a hierarchy based on consciousness deduced as i have already mentioned to analytic hierarchy process as well as interpretive structural model so each subsystem consists of three major components so as a in for the sake of symmetry we have kept six subdivisions for each of the major uh, subsystems of the grand cosmos what is significant is that in order to investigate through inner experience the outer cosmos there is a basic premise that the human 
framework is a perfect analog at the microcosmic level of the whole macrocosm. And therefore, by turning inwards, we experience the macrocosm. Well, roughly speaking, the supposition is that there are ganglia or nerve centers or channels of communication between microcosm, that is the human frame, consisting of the human body that guided by its brain, human mind and human spirit. So this human microcosm is a perfect analog of the macrocosm. And by turning inwards and concentrating on certain ganglia in the physical body or nerve centers in, in the brain, in the human microcosm, one is revealed or made privy to the secrets of the macrocosm. The model that we have put up, in fact, is very simple and consists of potential sources as well as certain specified current sources. This is an omniquantum spiritual force field and as a result of this all-pervasive spiritual force field, we have these potential sources which are enclosed within red rectangle on the left. And the other set of uh, circular sources are comparable to current sources. But these are not the electric currents. These are various forces. Since we have the force field here, these all consist, these particular potential sources are in fact sources for the force fields. The super positive pole at the top corresponds to the reservoir of all spirit forces and is the primary source for the spiritual energy. This energy, when it comes into contact with other mediums like mind or matter, then takes the form of forces or consciousness relating to mind as well as those relating to matter. For instance, the four fundamental forces of nature would be relevant to speak of in the physical universe. And among these, electromagnetic field is the one which we have been employing for sensing the various correlates in the physical environment of the human frame to test our hypotheses. This is quite commonplace to test it in the human brain. Neuroscientists are all greatly fascinated by the neuroscientific studies through fMRI, MRI and other scanning procedures. Similarly, as I go along, I point out that we have also been exploring at first the immediate environment of the concerned human being to learn about the environmental correlates in terms of the electromagnetic fields which pervade in the immediate environment of all humans. And particularly during their meditation, these display certain features of the macrocosm through inner experiences. 
So that is briefly to introduce the system. That there is no attempt here to try and explain the how it works, but this just to give you some uh, feel of the approach that we have taken. Eventually, as in any quantum system, the, any observations turn out to be classical ones, that is, determinate ones. Therefore, the final solution is quite simply obtained in terms of this graph and its solutions. However, going back to the original diagram once again, I should like to point out that there is one other major component in this is schematic which is presented here. Apart from the potential sources and the current sources which I mentioned. The current sources are of two kinds known as the spirit current sources and the sound current sources. The outward currents, that is the ones flowing from top to bottom, are the spirit currents. And the ones flowing from bottom upward, outside the enclosed red box are, or orange box, are the sound currents. So in the human microcosm, which is an analog of the macrocosm, and drawn on the right hand side and closed in the green box, we have similar arrangement and that is what we are observing. We are not observing the macrocosm as such because humanly it is not possible to go beyond physical universe. In the, we, all that we can do is to explore physical universe outside, but to explore regions lying beyond physical universe, the region of universal mind and region of universal spirit, there is no other way except to turn inward. And through meditation, as done by Tibetan lamas or Franciscan nuns or so many other schools whose neurology has been widely studied by neuroscientists lately, one learns about these phenomena. The other interesting uh, component here are the switches. These are the switches just underneath the current sources which are shown on the extreme left of the outside the red or orange enclosure. So underneath these you notice certain switches. Some of these switches are ordinarily closed. The ones in the physical universe are closed ones. Outside that, even the first switch is a great achievement to close. So it is only by meditational practice of the correct kind that one gets an entry beyond the physical universe into the region of universal mind. And this is possible as experienced by yogis or meditationists. So it is their first person reporting experiences as well as reporting which should be the basis of investigating these inner experiences and establishing them through hypotheses which could be tested. So these switches that I spoke of are new, in fact resonance operated switches. The, these switches close when the meditationist is in resonance with the concerned frequency of the particular stage 
which he is trying to reach inside his own self. So, as you adjust your frequency through concentration and match the frequency of the macrocosm at various levels, you are able to gain consciousness about those particular levels of the macrocosm. So that is the whole uh, philosophy behind it. Some of these frequencies which in our measurement of environmental correlates in the physical world as indirect measurements of the electromagnetic field surrounding the meditationist in his immediate environment, 0.2, 4.5 hertz, 76 hertz, 108 hertz, and 126 hertz. So these are the four frequencies which are repeatedly shown as being exhibited by meditationists in their individual meditational sessions as well as group prayer sessions. This is a, again another unique feature that our group is investigating. Normally the studies that neuroscientists make are on individual brains of the meditationists. By actually wiring them, they in fact do not use procedures which would be non-intrusive. We have used procedures which do not disturb the meditationist at all, do not touch the human frame, but only make measurements in the immediate environment by sensing the electromagnetic field intensity prevailing there and then analyzing its frequency spectrum and measuring the various uh, amplitudes of the concerned frequencies. So as I said, these four frequencies appear to be relevant ones. Three of these, the first three, seem to belong to the region of the universal mind and the 126 hertz frequency seems to belong to the highest region of pure spiritual content with no impurities of mind or matter. The, this is a well-established scientific practice that there is a conscious freedom on the part of experimenter or observer as to how to act and what to learn from experiments to be performed. And there is a growing realization in the last decade of the aptness and applicability of quantum theoretic modeling to cognitive domain of mind science. It follows as a natural corollary to suggest extension of the quantum theory to the domain of spiritual psychophysical dynamics. Psychophysical dynamics is under investigation increasingly, but there are very few groups who are investigating the spiritual psychophysical dynamics and we are particularly concerned with it. It would require separating the spiritual self or entity of the observers or experimenters describing a stream of conscious experiences that are experiential sites of a sequence of events from the psychophysical sites of the observed system, including not only the physical bodies and brains of all observers, but also their psychological minds as part of the observed system. And these would be described by quantum theory and measured as neural environmental correlates in the physical universe and as cognitive correlates in the psychological domain of mind science. The various tests for psychophysical domain or psychological domain in particular would be tests like Myers-Briggs personality test indicator 
consciousness quotient indicator or consciousness quotient inventory test and similarly freiburg mindfulness inventory test extraordinary experiences quotient test these tests have been developed by psychologists and are considered scientific way of testing the consciousness or the person's experiencing certain levels of consciousness in fact in our own rasa swami faith it is is stated that at each step of elimination of the media that surrounds the spirit the spirit in human frame is surrounded by mind as well as matter of the human body including brain which is a material substance at each step of elimination of the media that surrounds the spirit that is at each of its subtle form its inherent functions manifest themselves in a highly increasing progression and that eventually the spirit force comes out unalloyed in its purest subtlest form as the source of prime energy intelligence and bliss what is known in eastern philosophical literature in sanskrit as sat chit premanand sat for truth or energy prime energy chit for intelligence and anand for bliss so that is what represents the inner consciousness as experienced in the phenomenological investigations echoing similar sentiments swami ved bharti one of the meditationers of repute who has submitted his own brain under meditation to considerable tests by neuroscientists in one of his papers titled consciousness measurable or immeasurable says that principle nature is that the subtler substance can observe the grosser entity but the grosser can never observe the subtler body cannot observe mind but mind can observe the body brain being part of the body it implies that brain can never observe mind but mind can observe brain similarly spirit can observe the mind as well as brain but neither mind nor brain can observe the spirit the definition of the subtler given in eastern philosophy as in spanda shastra vedas is that energy or force field which is higher frequency than any relatively lower slower ones accordingly among the four frequencies that we have identified 4.5 hertz 76 hertz 108 hertz and 126 hertz 126 hertz frequency would represent the highest spiritual consciousness and it would be possible for an entity which has characteristic or natural frequency of 126 hertz to be able to observe those at 108 or 100 or at 76 or 4.5 but not vice versa so that is what we are trying to communicate in fact einstein's famous equation of photoelectric effect or or the one revealed in the context of photoelectric effect is e equal to h nu e standing for energy nu is standing for frequency and h being a constant so it shows that higher the frequency the more the energy so is it that when the spirit force is not alloyed by mind and corrupted by matter then it has maximum energy it is as a pure spirit the most capable one most energetic one most intelligent one and most blissful 
So the, that is the basis. The higher the energy, higher the, ener the, higher the frequency. Uh, higher the frequency, greater the consciousness. And therefore the capability. Now it's very difficult to uh, communicate what would be the necessary and sufficient common factors to verify these experiences. These have not been usually catalogued, but as I said, by observing the reports or the first-person phenomenologies who are co-investigators, who have been able to identify these factors, the necessary and sufficient factors for identifying the hierarchy of consciousness as laid down or as underlying the model presented to you will now be displayed in the form of a sound clip along with this slide. Uh, what you just now heard is a, a simulation of spiritual correlates which one experiences during meditation. The factors which are considered necessary and sufficient are mystic words which resound within you as you experience these internal phenomena. These mystic words are for the higher regions, the well-known five mystic words, Narayan at the lowest Brahman, first Brahman or the Vedas, Om at the next Brahman, second Brahman or the so-called Trikuti and then the third one, corresponding to the third Brahman at Sun is Rarang. These are regions of universal mind. Then beyond these, there are two mystic words for the purely spiritual region, which is the highest one. This is Soham at the gateway or at the first portal of the purely spiritual region and then Sat which is the most resplendent form of the Sat Purush Radha Swami. Radha Swami itself is having no form 
no shape. It is source of pure energy, truth, intelligence and blissfulness. So these myths have been relevant and therefore is supportive of our uh, results so far. So the, this shows the behavior of 126 Hertz under various group prayers conditions. And uh, one could wonder that the, there are a whole lot of frequencies. Why do we pick up these? These are the ones at which resonance takes place for the various individual participants. So they have also undergone these tests individually and we have noticed what is their dominant frequency and where they resonate. So those are the frequencies which are represented by these four frequencies. Here also we were able to show the uh, inverse square law has been true. So the uh, gain, decibel gain divided by distance squared from this measurement uh, sensor produced a constant. So inverse square law held here also. This is the behavior of 108 hertz and um, this is a group prayer session, so it is summative. There are several participants who resonate at 108, so it is the summation which show, shows up. Similarly, at 76 hertz and at 4.5 hertz. Now this is for some of the co-investigators. Now where it peaks is at 4.5 hertz. You notice at the leftmost part, it is highest in all cases. Other frequencies are present, but those are not the peaking frequencies or resonant frequencies. So the important concomitant of the spiritual experience is resonating at a particular frequency. So the frequency is identified as characteristic of a meditationist when it is a frequency where he gets highest decibel. So that's the way it has been done. It can vary at different times depending upon his mood, concentration and the ambience, what gain in decibel he acquires. But it would remain maximum for him. So what is important is that that's the resonant frequency. This is the these are the various sensors. So it's a 36 or 35 channel device and uh, five channels were inoperative. So 30 channel data are with us and a whole host of frequencies have been sampled. We are interested in just these four which have shown promise. So these are various plots. We notice that in the parietal lobe, particularly, among the four lobes of the brain, it is the parietal lobe which is most interesting for meditation at the higher spiritual levels. So these are preliminary things. These, these are the individual sets, those who are. Now these are again some of the features called out from the book that I mentioned. However, I've exceeded my time, I only show this a uh, power law equation which is widely used in psychophysics to um, measure perceived line length which is a linear relationship, perceived pain which has a cubic exponent, perceived brightness which has an exponent of one half. So it is through such tests that quantitative hypotheses can also be laid down if not quantitative, at least fuzzy qualitative hypotheses can be made and verified. Well, I, I don't think there's adequate time, but let me just point out very quickly a few things about the work of Price and Barrel, which are very interesting. 
One is this uh, phenomenon of associative thinking, which takes place when you ask the participants to rest their brain and mind, not think anything. However, contrary to this instruction, one finds a lot of activity in the brain when you ask people, advise people to rest and not engage in any active thought. And this is what is known as associative thinking or mind wandering or mind rambling, as you might call it. So they have investigated this and in fact they are, they, these are the areas which get activated when your mind is supposed to be at rest or your brain is not supposed to be active. These are very active areas in the brain. So similarly, there is another paradigm let me mention and that is the paradigm of second pain. This is the psychological um, uh, correl correlation between pain and the feelings and uh, that you get, depression, frustration, anxiety, anger as a result of pain. And then you have the uh, neural pathways going from the neck to the brain region. So these are correlated by these authors. So they are very interesting things. These are not our work. These belong to Price and Barrow. But I mentioned some of these. Uh, this is the second pain. This is another very interesting phenomenon. That is, you have an impulse and then one is fast-moving impulse and the other is slow-moving impulse. The fast-moving impulse causes the first pain. The slow-moving impulse causes the second pain and the second pain is much worse than the first pain. And every recurrence of the second pain is even worse. So all this has been investigated by neuroscientists and psychologists. I would like to draw your attention to this quote from Dalai Lama. Certainly physics designed the bombs, biology the germ warfare, chemistry the nerve gas, and so on. But it will be the unhealthy emotions of individuals that will trigger these horrors. These emotions can only be controlled, reshaped, and rechanneled by technologies developed from successful inner science. So it is impossible, it is important to integrate inner experience with scientific investigations and develop what one might call inner science or experiential science or phenomenological science. So I close here, already having exceeded my time considerably. Thank you.